Welcome to the Start Something Show. Join world-renowned experts, change agents, and everyday folks who have done the amazing. All here to help you start something incredible. Now it's time to step out, live your perfect day, and create a legacy with your host, Tina Dietz. What would it have been like to make music with Michael Jackson or Frank Sinatra or Cher or Karen Carpenter? My guest today, Thomas Baylor, has worked with all of those folks and many, many more in his long career as a musician, arranger, and composer. He's been a hit maker. When you hear the, the things he's composed, well, you'll know it immediately. Everything from She's Out of My Life by Michael Jackson. Well, I'll let him tell the story. Thomas Baylor is my guest today here on the Start Something Show. And if you're just joining us for the first time, I'm Tina Dietz. And thank you very much for listening in. This season two of the Start Something Show, the VIP Backstage Pass, is a different take than what we did in the first season. In season one, we pulled back the curtain on success from many, many successful people from around the world, getting into their highs, their lows, their failures, how they overcame them, and those stories of inspiration from these really cool people that I am very blessed to call colleagues and friends. In season two, we've got a little bit of a different take. We're going way deeper, talking with these folks, pulling back the curtain, not just on the stories of their success, but on the actual tools and tactics that they use, that they teach. These are mini training sessions for you to inspire yourself to go further, to go the distance, and to become more successful. I don't want to waste any time getting to the interview with Thomas because the stories that he tells are just incredible. I was pretty riveted. You'll hear that. I let him do most of the talking on this show. So we are going to just thank uh, some of the folks who are making the show possible today for a quick moment and then get right over to Thomas. So just in case you forgot, you're listening to a podcast. Imagine that. So if you love listening to podcasts, you may also love listening to audiobooks. Audible is where my audiobook publishing clients sell the most books. And this is for good reason, because Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from. And this is for everything from your iPhone to Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Go download your first book for free. Check it out, courtesy of us here at the Start Something Show. Head over to audibletrial.com slash start something and start listening. Hello, Superstarters. This is Tina Dietz. Thanks for joining me here on our Backstage Pass with Tom Baylor. Uh, if you've read the intro, I'm sure you know all about who Tom is and his extraordinary accomplishments in the entertainment industry, working with... <laughs> Everyone, basically. And uh, now Tom has uh, put his wisdom and um, some extraordinary uh, thoughts on living and creating a life that really fulfills you and is of service to others. I am enjoying this book just so enormously. I'm even reading it with my children, even though uh, I'm not quite sure what they're going to get out of it, uh, because it's just amazing. The book is called What You Want, wants you. And Tom, thanks for joining me here to continue our conversation on the Backstage Pass for the Start Something Show. Pleasure to be here with you, Tina. Well, I want to jump right in because I've been wanting to ask you this question. I love the title of your book, What You Want Wants You. Would you elaborate on what you what you mean by that? Well, this is basic this book is the philosophy with which I was raised. It really started with my grandmother. And and the first time I heard it is when she talked about, you know, the story of the music man. Oh, yes. Well, you know, that really happened. I, I was I was fortunate enough to work with Meredith Wilson. It was a marvelous man who created this whole piece. And and, and he took it off of a story as more of a, a legend that would happen. This, these these hucksters would come into the small town. And say, I'm moving here. I'm starting a community band. It's going to bring the community together. And they'd sell him a whole big piece. And, and of course, he would sell them the instruments. And then when it was time for rehearsal, the guy had skipped town. And you'd have all these instruments with no way to play them. 
Well, this guy came to St. Joe, Missouri, and he did this exact thing. And my dad was about eight years old, and he said, Mom, I really want to play the trumpet, you know. And grandmother explained to me, she said, Tommy, I didn't have the wherewithal to buy him a trumpet. But you know what? I said to myself, I want to buy him a trumpet. And she said, two days later, this guy knocks on my door and he said, I just came to town. I started this new business. I hear you've got this bookkeeping service. Uh, I've got kind of a large operation if you're able to help me, but I'll pay you this much to do it. And she said, guess what? <laughs> I bought him the trumpet. And she said, what I have found is that what I want, if what I want serves others, I get it. Powerful. Very powerful. Very powerful. So uh, the book and your experiences, you know, growing up, your experiences throughout uh, your career have kind of led you to this place of, you know, mentoring and, and paying it forward. Although I understand you've done, you know, a fair amount of this throughout your, uh, you know, entire career. When you're mentoring somebody, what is kind of your um, approach to, to helping somebody? Well, you know what I do with everyone I've ever mentored? Uh, I mean, obviously, pretty, when you first start, I didn't have an idea what I was doing. But I knew what I, I treated it the way I was raised. So when people come to me and they say, I would like to work with you, my first question is, what do you want? And the interesting thing with college-age kids is when I ask them what they want, usually the first three things they say is what they don't want. Well, I don't want to do this, and I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, so I usually say something like, perhaps you didn't hear the question. What do you want? What you don't want is what led you to me. Let's concentrate on what you want. And if you what you want serves others, I believe you'll get it. So it opens up possibilities for them, and they tend to open up. And, um, and I use phrases that tend to shock people sometimes. Uh, I had this young woman who actually came to me as a sophomore in high school. And she said, I want to go to USC. And I want to study music industry. And I, and I didn't know she was a sophomore in high school. And I said, well, great. You know, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be happy to talk with you about that. And then I asked her, I said, well, you should probably get your application in. And she said, well... I'm just a sophomore in high school. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know what you want to do when you're a sophomore in high school. This is beautiful. So, I, right. so I've worked with her ever since, and now she's a senior at SC. But when she was maybe a sophomore, she would call me, you know, and we would do Skype sessions. And one day she called me. She said, okay, I've figured out what I want to do. I want to manage artists. And would you help me, uh, you know, talk over this? And I say, yeah, well, here's what I do. And this is my dad's message. It was always an I message. This is what I would do instead of saying, this is what you should do. Yes. So I said, what I would do is I would start with the artists that I love because there's a passion there. And I would find out who is managing them. And then I would drill down into those companies and find something that resonates with me in my heart. Oh my gosh, they did this. This is wonderful. I believe in this. This is in line with my values. And then I would email them and I would say, you know what? I ran across you because I decided I wanted to be, and tell them the truth and an abbreviated form. And, um, and I resonate with your values and I would like to intern for you. And she said, well, they're not going to pay any attention to me. They don't know anything about me. They don't care. And I said, Zoe, you're not that smart. And she said, what? I said, you're telling them, you're telling the future. If you were good at this, the world would be the path to your door. You're making up a story, and that story is actually probably a lie. It's at least as much of a lie as it is the truth. So if you're going to tell a story, tell a story that they can't wait to talk to you. And it changed her perspective. She applied to three different agencies and was accepted by all of them. Wow. And she's flying. I mean, when she gets out of school. That's, that's, that's really great. Well, to have a mentor from that young of an age uh, is, first of all, somewhat unusual. And also just what a, an incredible opportunity for a young person, um, first of all, to, to reach out like that. And, and secondly, to actually take the coaching. Well, when we're, when we're at that age, we tend to, a lot of the, because the kids I'm mentoring are usually in their 20s. I had this one fellow 
exactly one of the first people I mentored. And I asked him what I want. Well, I said, what do you want? And he said, I've always wanted to be an A&R man at Capitol Records since I was a little boy. And I said, what are you doing about it? So if you remember my story about my bicycle, I was asking the same questions my dad did. You know, I said, what are you doing about it? And he said, well, I, um, I got an interview last summer and, and I said, well, how did it go? And he said, well, I didn't get the job. And I said, well, tell me about the interview. So he said, well, I went in there and I showed him my work and told him what I'd done. And, and, you know, and, and I said, okay, well, that's a normal thing to do. How long before you were interviewed, did you know who you were interviewing with? And he said about three weeks. And I said, well, here's what I would do. If I knew who I was interviewing with, I would drill down on that person because he's probably going to be in production. Find something he produced that I absolutely loved. And maybe he was like famous for this bass line in this one hit record, you know? And when I met him, I'd say, Frank, I'm so glad to meet the guy who created the bass line and so and so song. And he, and I'll tell you what Frank's going to think. He's going to think, this guy gets me. I need him. Yes, because what we all want is to be gotten. What we all want is to be, look into somebody else's eyes and go, ah, you see me, I see you. Exactly. Well, guess yeah. what? he did that and he got, and he got a job. So now the, the backstory of that, and this is so amazing because so he, he worked with me and he was really drinking up this whole philosophy, which is a very simple one and it's so effective. And he's so, so now EMI completely buys because they own a big percentage of capital records and they, they bought the whole company. Well, they had to lay off 25% of the workforce. Now the CEO of EMI is a lovely gentleman and he pulled together the entire workforce in Hollywood into an arena, you know, into an auditorium. And he explained to them that this is not easy for him to do. But you got to plug the holes in the boat so it doesn't sink. And, and, and the workforce isn't a hole, but we were expending more than we were making. So we have to do. Yes. Yeah. Something so has to happen. So we tried to explain it. And then we took what he said, are there any questions? And this young man that I had coached stood up and he said, Yes, I have a question. Uh, I'm the low man on the totem pole. I've been working here for six months. This is my dream job. This is what I've wanted all of my life. I love this company. I love what I do for this company. What do I have to do to convince you to keep me? And he said, you just did. That's powerful stuff right there to speak out in front of all of those people and, to make that kind of a stand. And to tell the truth. All he did is tell the truth. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. It's the op uh, the opposite of a victim mentality, right there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, you cannot simultaneously be of service and be a victim. I quite, that's a very good. You know, I never thought of it that way, Tina. But I hear you're out. I never did either. It just came to me. So I think we'll keep that one. What do you think? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> you might find that in my newsletter this week. <laughs> very good. Very good. I love to be quoted. Uh, all right. I want to switch back over into your experience in the music industry for, uh, for a minute because you've worked with some just extraordinarily talented people um, behind the scenes, people who were, you know, in, in right behind the, the microphone, as it were, um, hit makers and all of that. And uh, many people who are high profile um, are known for having a fair amount of turmoil in their lives. And from what you've seen, why do you think that creative genius is so often associated with drama and mental illness, even suicide and, and, and tragedy like that? Because we can take that from history, too. But from your experience, what would you say? Why does that seem to happen? Well, the people that I know that have been superstars that have died, um, there were three in particular, uh, Elvis Presley, Karen Carpenter, and I were very close. In fact, we almost got married at one point. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. And, um, and you know, Michael Jackson, of course. And I worked with Michael from the time he was 13 till he passed. I didn't feel so much turmoil in their lives, but I experienced what it was like just being around them. I mean, one day Michael and I, maybe he was in his thirties and we, so I worked with him for 20 years and 
we we found ourselves in the booth of the studio alone, you know, for a few minutes. And I said, Mike, how are you? You know, and I pointed at him. I said, how are you? And he said, man, I just wish I could go to the store. He was a prisoner. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. It's so much pressure to have that kind of notoriety. When Karen and I were going together, if we wanted to go to a movie, her agent would call the theater and we would slip in a side door after the movie started and leave during the credits. So so all of a sudden you're sneaking around almost like a criminal and you're anything but. If, yeah, you're the polar opposite. So, yeah, I would imagine that has... A pretty heavy impact because you're always under scrutiny. And the, exactly. And and I worked with Diana Ross, and who I adore. And when I... Oh, Thomas, we had just a little technical blip there, and I want to make sure we get back into the story. You had started to share an experience you had with Diana Ross. Yes. Uh, you know, Diana was was such a star, and at a time, and she's so powerful, and she's so brilliant. And it was tough. Because what I noticed was that the guys in the business could be decisive and powerful and, and they were respected for it. And, and Diana and, and, and Barbara Streisand were, were, got some labels they didn't like, you know, from being the mm-hmm. same thing. And when I worked with Diana, when I first worked with her, she had quite a shield around her. And, uh, uh, but once she, trusted me she was just like any other wonderful human being you know and she said you know i am a corporation we got we got to talking because i work with her a lot and we got to talking one day and she said you know i'm a corporation and when i get on mic if my team behind me hasn't done their job i get the i bear the brunt of it and she said so i get like a little paranoid you know about is this done is that done how's the sound what are we doing you know and she she's producing when she should be the artist you know i know very few artists that are good producers of themselves they're great maybe great at producing someone else so my point was to her was that this is my job, Diana. When you work with me, all you have to be is Diana Ross. And she was like a little girl. She said, really? <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, that's my job. So it was my job to make sure that everybody on that team was working at full force. And I did it where Diana would do it a little bit because she was nervous. She, there would be a little negative tinge to it. Yeah, so, that can sometimes happen. You get, people get stressed out. It comes off as negative. And my job was, let's kick ass for Diana. Let's have some fun. Everybody's good at what they do. I'm great at team building. And I, I build teams the way that, that I was taught for the way I built a band. And my dad, I said, Dad, I don't know which drummer to use. And he said, which one feels right, son? Oh, well, Dave does. And he said, well, if it were me, I'd use him. So, and I was taught that feeling is our best barometer. So that's the way, and, and I'm slipping something else in, but basically the people that I have worked with that have suffered and died is that it is a tremendous, tremendous burden to carry to have that kind of notoriety. Now, I think it's different if you're a politician because politicians have a different sensitivity sharing. I know they may all be sensitive, but there's a difference in the sensitivity sharing than than there is in being an artist. And for Michael, I mean I think I mentioned he just wanted to be able to go to the store. And he was a prisoner. And and uh and Karen Carpenter was a prisoner. And uh and to an extent Elvis was too. So it's tough. That so as much as we appreciate these works of art that inspire us and that we listen to, and whether it's the music industry or actors or whatever, maybe the best gift that we can give people is to keep remembering their humanity. Yes. You know, and very few of them have had marriages that work. There are a few, and they're stunning when they do. But, I mean, you know, I work with Billy Joel. I love Billy, you know. What an extraordinary man he is. And, but, you know, I, I, I don't know many of the people in the industry that have had successful mar- marriages. 
Oddly enough, I know a lot of managers and producers who do the guy the. <laughs> <laughs> not not quite the same time in the spotlight, a little bit more, um, for lack of a better way to put it, power behind the throne or behind the scenes. Yes. I Do you actually, think that makes a big difference? I have something to share, if it's okay, about Billy Joel that I think... We- yeah, go right yeah. ahead. I mean, I can. I think I can sing about three quarters of the man's songbook by heart. So, yeah, I'd want to hear that. <laughs> Billy is amazing. And, and he normally didn't use vocal arrangers, but when he did Innocent Man, which has been his landmark album um you know the band the the album was an homage to the influences and his his musical influence and he did not want to be in charge of that completely he wrote the songs of course and he also had just fallen in love with christy brinkley and she was in the studio with us every day and it was just such a joyful occasion and we were having a ball making this album and, and um, and I had hired the singers and done the vocal arrangements for him and, and watching him, he was actually writing the song as we writing the songs, we'd record a song that he had written a few weeks later, but he was still writing the album. So I watched him and when he wrote lyrics, when Billy writes lyrics, he used at this, at this time anyway, he used like a college composition book, you know, with lines in it and stuff. You know, oh the, yeah, the, the little, that's what he used. Yeah, the little binder, whatever they call it, the circular binder on the side, whatever that thing is. Anyway, he would, so he would, and he was writing, um, I think he was writing longest time, for the longest time. And I watched him write the lyric on page, on the first page, and then he would turn the page and he'd write the lyric again, but there would be a word or two different. And he had turned the page and write it again, and he would do this 50, 60 times. And observing him, I said, wow, Billy, I've never seen anybody write like this. You don't cross anything out. And he says, oh, no, because I think if I cross something out, I'm sending a message to myself that I've made a mistake. This is a journey. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really something to bring forward, isn't it? Yeah. To think about. Yeah. If we cross it out, if we negate it, it's like throwing it off like it has no value exactly and what it is is a building block and he said i'm through when the ideas start stop coming and you know picasso used to say painting's never finished i just stopped painting that's beautiful too and so many of the the what we consider the masters in artwork you can find previous versions underneath the version that's you know made made visible to the public or that they kept the painting and we're adding to it five years later because it just wasn't quite there. And, you know, but taking that kind of artistic sensibility into our lives is important. Yes. And and I would argue the point, just uh, not argue it, but I would add to that that I'm not so sure that it wasn't quite there. It's just that there's something else appeared through time, through, a, you know, that that it didn't make the other one bad. It wasn't that it wasn't there. It was that now it's here. You know, it was there. Yeah. We were a certain person at five years old and we're a certain other person at 35. But we were just as good at five, right? Yeah, we're just as good at any point. Like, we keep, keep coming back to this point of, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Yes. Right. And you know, I'm okay. So, when I'm, so no, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I wanted to take um, some of the what I'm hearing in these conversations about uh, pressure and notoriety about being put in a box, because one of the things that is unexpected for folks as they're um, developing any kind of idea, whether they're developing as an artist or a parent in their career or as a, as, or, you know, especially in a business, because of course I'm mainly with entrepreneurs. It's that um, what st- tends to st- become sticking points for people is this development of identity that we keep coming back to and needing to step into something new that they haven't before. Mm-hmm. So what what would be some things that you have either learned or that you would suggest um, about to offer some mentoring advice to folks who are uh, finding themselves stuck into this place of, I'm not sure that that's me or who, uh, who am I to, to say that about myself or, wow, can I really charge that much or whatever the case may be for people developing that identity? Um, 
you know, again, it goes back to this formula that I, I ask, anytime I have a quandary, I ask myself, what do I want? And if I'm looking at a financial issue, you know, like, what am I going to charge for this? I ask myself, what do I want? And a number comes to me. And I trust that number. I, I have learned to trust the universe so much that I know that I'm not that smart. But everything is available to me. When I, and when I ask myself what I want, whatever comes to me is my declaration. And I say, okay, that's what I want. Now, I have never had the point where I've come to find that that was too much. In fact, there was one case, I was working for Anheuser-Busch, and, um, and they asked what my fee was, and I told them. And the guy said, that's you serious. And I said, well, here, I'll make you a deal. If after our show is finished, if my fee is not the last thing on your mind, pay me nothing. That's quite a statement. And the fee was never discussed after that. But I trusted. And you know what? At the end of it, he said, you earned that. And I said, well, you, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, what would you think I was going to do? I, yeah, I'm exactly. not in this business to, you know, to make you unhappy. I'm in this business to make you thrilled. So I trust. Again, it's trusting. And what I find is doubt is the biggest enemy. But doubt comes from fear. And if I question myself, am I good enough for this? I don't really know. But if I ask myself what I want, something comes to me. So what do I want? I want to write a song. When I, when I was doing the Ford account, I, I got in this business very early on and made a ton of money because I was asked by Ford Motor Company to put a group together for them, and that lasted for two years. And after that, I realized that my income was going to change, because that was over. And I thought, well, you know what? I like my income at this level. So I said, what do I want? Well, I want my income to stay at this level. What are you going to do about it? It goes back to the bicycle. What are you going to do about it? And it, and it and it, immediately it came to me, well, you love to write songs, write a hit. So I said, I'm going to write a hit. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I did, and I did write a hit. And this goes back to the whole idea of it is more important to focus on the what than the how. Once you have come to the what, the how will, can show up. The how will show up if, we, if, if I'm open to it. Yes, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, for all of our superstarters out there who are looking to get going and fulfill their dreams and goals, let's leave them with a couple of action steps, some things that they can do in the next, even, you know, the next week or two to help them start something. Absolutely. The word discovery comes to mind. And to me, it starts with passion. I think when you're an entrepreneur, you're doing this because you love it. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother. If you're in it just for money, I don't know anybody that's ever done things. Steve Jobs never did anything for money. He said that so many times. And he was a billionaire. But what he did was serve others. And so the action steps to me are this formula that's laid out in this book, which is very simple. Declare what you want and start listening and to be a good host to the ideas that come to you. Because I believe when we declare what we want, the universe, I don't ask the universe what I want. I don't think they're in a, the universe is in the business of answering questions. But I do believe the, the universe is in the, uh, of, of exchanging energy. So when we declare what we want, if it serves others, I get ideas. And when those ideas come in, it's my job because I have free will to accept and, and be a good host to those ideas even though most of the time I don't understand them, because if I did, they wouldn't be new. So now I'm trusting something I don't understand, and my next action step is I say to myself, I'm taking action. I don't even know what I'm taking action on, but there's something about declaring that I'm taking action. All of a sudden, that idea 
goes out into the universe and picks up everything that I'm going to need to make that a thing because ideas alone are just ideas. An idea needs a human in this realm to become a thing. And then what I do after I say I'm taking action and more ideas start coming in is my dad's words, I trust like a tea kettle. If you put a tea kettle on the stove, what does it do? And I said, well, water boils. He said, not yet, son. You have to put fire on it. What is the fire? The fire is the fact that you want this, that you're, that it's going to work for others. It's going to help other people. That's the fire. That's the passion. And, and he said, so that's the fire under the kettle. Now, do you wait for the water to boil? I say, no. And he said, okay, yes, but you now tuned your ears for that whistle, haven't you? So you've, you've heightened your awareness. So those are the steps that I take is to trust. And the thing that will shut that off, is doubt. So I trust. And you know what? It's never not worked for me. So those are the action steps. Declare what you want. Be a good host. Declare that you're taking action, even though you don't know what it is. And trust like a tea kettle. Beautiful. Beautiful. So finally, Tom, what's the legacy you want to leave? Um... That I love people, and I was here in service in my time. Well, I think that that is something we can declare is already well on its way to happening. <laughs> well, and, thank and, you. And, and, yeah, and he had fun. And he had fun. Yeah, beautiful, Tom. Thank you so much. I I'm so enjoying your book and everything. And for stup- super starters out there. Take these words to heart. Get out there this week and start something. And also, thanks you know, again, Tom. Yes, and if I just may say that I in, I in, invite you to go to thomasbaylor dot com and and just check into my newsletter because people are enjoying it. I'm having such a ball writing it. So sign up and just enjoy. And we'll make sure all those links are uh, on the page here I, as well. I appreciate that, Tina. Thank you of so course. much. Of course. Right. Thank you, Tom. We'll talk soon. All right. All right. Tina D. here with just a couple more things before we wrap up. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And of course, visit us at the startsomethingshow.com where you can find all the show notes, all the links, all the resources, and tons more to help you on your journey of success. We are here to help you reach the hearts, the ears, the minds of the people that you are looking to connect with. So it's all at the startsomethingshow.com. We'll see you in our next episode.